Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, Wednesday afternoon lecture. Um, I'm Susan Gottesman, so I'll, um, and on behalf of Lambda Lunch, I'll, I'll do the introduction. I should tell you that those of you who come away from this seminar wanting to know a whole lot more about what's going on these days are invited to join us at Lambda Lunch tomorrow when, at 11, when, when Ron will be um, giving a, a different talk about, about some current work that's going on. If you don't know when that is, ask, ask me afterwards and I'll tell you where and when it is. Um, so, so Ron Breaker, our, our speaker today, grew up um, in the Midwest in Wisconsin and attended the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point as an undergrad and then went on to Purdue um, where he worked on, on making um, RNA, synthetic RNAs that might freeze uh, ribosomes so that they could be crystallized and I guess got caught by RNA at that point and, and as you will see has found out new and exciting things about it. Um, from there he did his, his postdoc at Scripps with Jerry Joyce uh, looking at, at test tube evolution and then um, took a position at Yale where he, where he is and where he is now the Henry Hor Ford, the second professor, um, and, uh, and an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So, so as I understand it, and uh, you may hear this again from Ron, he, he was interested in, in how you could get RNA to do the things you might want it to do in terms of, of recognizing small molecules and was doing uh, chemistry to, to make RNAs that would do that when uh, he and his lab decided to find out whether that happened in the actual biological uh, world and in fact found that there were uh, what, what he called riboswitches in many bacteria and those riboswitches are regulatory cis-acting sequences that, that fold up, recognize very specific molecules and regulate downstream gene expression and um, his work and, and work by a couple of other groups opened up this huge uh, field that, that we're all fascinated by is that work um, was very quickly recognized with the Eli Lilly Award um, from ASM in 2005. Um, I'm just going to pick a few of these things and the Molecular Biology Award from the National Academy of Sciences in 2006 and, uh, and others. Um, so we're very excited to have you come and tell us about RNA and the wonderful things. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. And thanks to all of you uh, for coming out. Thanks to those uh, who I've had a chance to talk with uh, throughout the day, um, uh, both the, uh, uh, the PIs and the students. They've uh, been uh, wonderful uh, hosts. have had a great time uh, today. So my, my goal for this talk is to give you um, an, a general overview of riboswitches, give you a sense of how many we find, how we study them, and then to give you some of the uh, uh, arguments that we put together that support the notion that RNA molecules, these metabolite binding RNAs, can work as uh, genetic, uh, not only genetic switches, but we can manipulate those genetic switches uh, for, for potential therapeutic applications. So we now have a number of examples of small organic compounds that selectively bind to these RNAs, inhibit critical, uh, the expression of critical genes, and uh, inhibit or even kill uh, uh, bacteria. Um, so uh, I wanted to start this out by focusing on where these RNAs might have, have come from. And, and, and therefore, I, I wanted to feature that in my title that perhaps, at least I want to get you to think about the possibility that some of these RNAs may, may be of very uh, ancient origin. Not all of them, but some of them may be very old. But we can harness some of these uh, ancient gene control elements uh, for possible therapeutic applications. So uh, I put out this image here, which is, which is one of the better cartoons I found that, that, that uh, allows me to talk about the RNA world. So the, the best uh, hypothesis or the best theory in place to describe a number of, of uh, discoveries um, over the last few decades for the origin of life is the RNA world uh, hypothesis. And the RNA world, let me see if I can get my laser pointer to work. Okay, I don't have a laser, so if somebody has a, a pointer, uh, that would be great. 
Uh, so on the bottom of this graphic shows an RNA with a little uh, circular arrow uh, coming from it. Uh, that I implies that at one time there were RNA molecules that were able to replicate in the absence of DNA and proteins. And then further up on this graphic, uh, you have uh, the emergence of DNA. So these very primitive RNA world organisms gave rise to, uh, to RNA uh, 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 organisms that also uh, uh, carried DNA, stored their information uh, as DNA. And then after uh, um, uh, further steps of evolution, see if you can get this to work. Oh, there you go. Oh, that one's good. Thank you. So after additional steps, you give rise to the modern era now where you have DNA, RNA, and proteins, which gives you all the various branches of the, the tree of life, the three domains uh, of life that we have today. All right, so um, there's a number of reasons why we think that life evolved in this, in this fashion. Uh, and I've listed a few of them on this, on this uh, graphic. Uh, for example, DNA monomers are made from RNA monomers. Uh, which implies that perhaps metabolism laid down RNA synthesis and, and biosynthesis first, uh, and then ultimately DNA was derived from those initial RNA molecules. Uh, m this is one of my favorites. Most coenzymes are derivatives of RNA. So uh, even in modern cells, uh, uh, protein enzymes carry out many chemical reactions using uh, coenzymes that are largely based on RNA uh, chemistry. Uh, and so the implication is that perhaps these coenzymes were, were, were uh, laid down early in evolution by RNA enzymes, and then as protein uh, enzymes emerged later on in evolution, they just co-opted the same coenzymes to do similar chemical reactions. Uh, information transfer from DNA to proteins intimately involves RNA. Um, RNA naturally stores genetic information and catalyzes chemical reactions. We call these things ribozymes. In other words, RNA has the ability to do what DNA does, uh, and it has the ability to do what proteins do. So it's really uh, two functions, phenotype and genotype in one package. And uh, again, one of my favorites, all encoded proteins are made by ribozymes. Um, so the ribosome is a ribozyme, uh, and at the core uh, of this protein-making machine are nucleotides that are stitching together the amino acids. Now, uh, for the work that I want to describe today, I want you to think about the possibility that RNA-based switches, these are, these are simple RNA molecules that are folding into some three-dimensional shape, they're binding small organic compounds, and they're controlling biological processes in modern cells, primarily the, the expression of, of genes, uh, that perhaps riboswitches might have allowed RNA world organisms to control complex metabolic state in the complete absence of proteins and nucleic acids, or uh, proteins and DNA. All right, so what is a riboswitch? In modern cells, riboswitches are almost always found in the five prime untranslated regions of messenger RNAs. They're almost exclusively found in bacteria, although I'll show you an example or two that are, that are present in eukaryotes. So you have this situation. You have a messenger RNA. The, the dark area here is the coding region. You have the non-coding portion of both the five prime and three prime ends. Riboswitches are almost always in that five prime untranslated region. And they have two fundamental uh, domains. Uh, one is an aptamer that is uh, um, forming this receptor for the small organic compound. And the other part is what we call the expression platform. It's just another structural part of the RNA whose shape is dictated by whether or not the, the aptamer has bound some small organic compound. And so this thing controls gene expression, and it's a sort of a structural platform upon which you, you graph the aptamer. And so we call this an expression platform. All right, there are a number of mechanisms that we find. I'll give you a slide uh, uh, next, I believe, that, that sort of details the, uh, that gives you a fuller list of the mechanisms. But the two most common mechanisms for gene control are shown on this cartoon. On the left-hand side is transcription control, and on the right-hand side is translation control. They're, they're, they're very similar with the exception uh, of a, a, a particular location of the expression platform, and I'll point that out. So in the leftmost cartoon, uh, the DNA, this, this is the DNA molecule. Imagine this is the genomic DNA. 
the uh, little green box is RNA polymerase. And as RNA polymerase initiates transcription, it starts to make the RNA, of course, from the 5' end. So the first part of the RNA to uh, exit the, the RNA polymerase is the aptamer. And then second is the expression platform. So these parts of the riboswitch are made, of course, before the coding region is, is produced. Now, if, it's, if the riboswitch is controlling transcription, uh, usually the, the aptamer is going to control the formation of a terminator stem, a strong stem followed by a run of U's. This is very uh, uh, typical of, the, of, of classic yanofsky style transcription attenuation. Strong stem, run of U's, causes RNA polymerase to stall and eventually fall off the template. Uh, immediately upstream, of course, is the aptamer, and if the ligand binds, it will control whether or not an anti-terminator can form. So if uh, the li in this case, if the ligand binds, it ties up a portion of sequence that otherwise would form an, form an anti-terminator. That anti-terminator, if it formed, would prevent the formation of the terminator. Okay, so this is just mutually exclusive formation of structures, um, and the ligand dictates whether or not uh, that, that, switching, that structural switching event occurs. Uh, a same kind of event occurs uh, with translation control with the exception that the, the stem hides the ribosome binding site or the Schein-Delgarno site, okay? And you control translation. Now, in both these graphics, I'm showing a number of stars. What those indicate is that there's actually kinetic processes that are very important to determine whether the riboswitch is going to function. In other words, what, what is important here is not necessarily that the RNA reach uh, thermodynamic equilibrium with its ligand. Usually, these processes uh, are so, so fast that, the, that, that the, the ligand, at least the last process, is so fast that the ligand cannot reach thermodynamic equilibrium. So these are probably kinetically driven switch, switches, uh, at least in many cases. The aptamer takes time to fold. Number two here, the ligand has a certain rate of association with the RNA. Number three, does the anti-terminator form or does the terminator form? All these things take time. And number four, speed of RNA polymerization. If RNA polymerase is incredibly fast and these processes are slow, then the, uh, the uh, genetic switch can't fire in a, in a, in a time frame that's fast enough uh, because RNA polymerase has already left this point uh, uh, of the genetic decision. So when you see these riboswitches, don't think of them as static receptors that reach thermodynamic equilibrium, but it's much more complex, probably a, um, a kinetically driven process in many cases. Uh, here's just a very brief summary of the, the types of riboswitches and their um, expression platforms. We have now more than 20 different aptamer classes. And when I say class, it usually means a completely different RNA architecture that binds a ligand. In, in, in many cases, it's a different ligand. But in some cases, we have multiple riboswitch architectures that bind the same ligand. So uh, what kinds of ligands are they recognizing? Uh, coenzymes and their derivatives are most common. So uh, coenzyme B12, thiamine pyrophosphate, FMN, uh, S adenosylmethionine, or SAM. In this case, there are four different major architectures that bind S adenosylmethionine. And we have a, a, another major, a fifth major architecture, that binds the metabolic burn product of SAM called SAH. Uh, molybdenum cofactor, tetrahydrofolate. So there's a sugar compound, glucosamine 6 phosphate, that's sensed by a very special riboswitch that is also a ribozyme. It undergoes a self-cleavage event. Uh, pu purines and derivatives, I'll mention these in more detail in my talk. We have an example, or actually now two examples, of, of riboswitches for the second messenger, bacterial second messenger, cyclic digMP. And amino acids, uh, um, there's actually more than two now that we have. I've mentioned the expression platform mechanisms, transcription termination, and translation initiation. I've also briefly mentioned self-destructing ribozyme. This is one that will, will sense uh, glucosamine 6-phosphate. But there are examples of transcriptional interference, transacting riboswitches. They're produced at one site, and they base pair to a remote site to control gene expression. And I will give you a cartoon of a eukaryotic example of mRNA splicing control by a, by a metabolite-binding riboswitch. All right, just zooming in a little bit more now on a particular bacterium. This is uh, the bacterium Bacillus subtilis, showing the circular genome in the center, and the colored flags on the outside are various genes that are controlled uh, uh, by riboswitches in this organism. And this shows, I believe this is now a complete list of the validated riboswitches in this organism. Now, there are more riboswitches, but they're not all present in all bacteria. This one has, um, I think, about 10 or so validated riboswitches 
but it has probably an equal number of great riboswitch candidates whose ligands remain unknown. So there's, there's certainly going to be more riboswitches in, in, in many bacteria, including Bacillus subtilis. And I'll just note a couple of things here that there are some riboswitches like this. This is our self-cleaving ribozyme. Controls one gene. That gene codes for a protein that makes glucosamine 6-phosphate, which when it builds up to high enough concentration, causes the messenger RNA to self-destruct. Right, so only one riboswitch controlling one gene. On the other extreme, I believe there are 11 versions of SAM sensing riboswitches controlling, I think, a total of 26 genes in this organism. So these are multiple versions of the same riboswitch class at various parts uh, of, the, of the microbial genome. All right, so again, uh, great diversity, but there will be even more than what we know of now. I wanted to focus on one uh, class in particular to give you a sense of how we study riboswitches and how we are beginning to assess whether they're druggable targets. So uh, the example that I'm going to focus on here is purine riboswitches. Um, this is a, a story, this, this actually was this publication and, and, and several in this series that inspired us to look for guanine sensing riboswitches. And, and, and Zalkin and co-workers at Purdue, where I was a, a, a graduate student, in fact, the year that I arrived as a new grad student uh, um, was the year this paper was published. And I remember there being a lot of excitement about the fact that the entire biosynthetic operon for biosynthesis of purines, guanine and adenine, had been cloned. And very quickly, uh, the Zulkin lab had identified that this operon was controlled by an adenine sensing protein. And they knew it was controlled by guanine, but they couldn't find the protein that controlled gene expression, right? So we want to sense this compound. And there's no protein out there that was identified to, to regulate this operon. All right, so what we did um, much later, uh, more than a decade later, we began to look at the leader sequences of this RNA and, and other RNAs involved in purine metabolism. And we identified a highly conserved RNA structure where the red nucleotides uh, I think in this image, the red nucleotides indicate that, that the bases are um, uh, conserved in 90% or greater of the examples that we have. So we had these highly conserved bases interspersed amongst this three-stem junction, and the ends indicate any nucleotide, and the lines indicate that it can be any nucleotide as long as they're base paired. All right, so we have this wonderfully conserved uh, RNA structure. Uh, that we felt was a candidate for a guanine sensing uh, uh, RNA. So how are we going to um, examine this RNA? Well, first of all, we want to know where the RNA is. In Bacillus subtilis, there are five of these things in the genome. Four of them, I color red here, because we now know those are indeed guanine sensing riboswitches. And they control various purine uh, uh, metabolic genes as expected. The last one here, I color orange. This was an efflux. It's been now determined to be a purine efflux pump. The cell turns this gene on when it has too many purines and dumps the purines out, out of the cell. This one is a slightly different flavor, and I'll note that one um, in, a, in a subsequent slide. All right, so uh, very widespread RNA amongst uh, purine metabolic genes. Here's the sequence for one of those examples. This is, for the X, this is right in front of the XPT gene, uh, which is a, a protein involved in uh, uh, transporting or phosphoribosylating um, uh, purines um, when the cells bring them into uh, uh, purines from ex exterior to the interior. Uh, so in the box, you can see a three-stem junction. You can see in orange, the anti-terminator stem is highlighted, and then the strong stem here followed by a run of use, that's our terminator, and the start codon is further down in the, in the uh, RNA. So you see all the features that I had in the cartoon. How are we going to determine whether this binds purines and, uh, and how it controls gene expression if it does? Well, one of the first things we do with every riboswitch class is if we have a ligand candidate, in this case guanine, we want to subject this RNA to an analysis to determine whether the compound binds. And we use a method we call inline probing. And I have a, a graphic that explains very briefly how inline probing works. As many of you know, RNA is incredibly unstable. It will spontaneously fall apart. I mean, enzymes will destroy it, but it also spontaneously falls apart because you've got this nucleophile, this 2' hydroxyl, enslaved next to the phosphorus. So if this uh, um, hydroxyl becomes deprotonated, it can attack, and you can cleave the, uh, the, the, the 5' 
um, uh, uh, oxyanion uh, off of this uh, phosphorus center. So you go through this uh, intermediate over to a cleaved uh, RNA chain, so you break the chain. This reaction is accelerated by a number of mechanisms. I've list listed three of them here that we manipulate in this assay. Number one, we can encourage the deprotonation of this hydroxyl group by raising the pH. So we have a higher uh, proportion of the RNAs deprotonated at any given time. The other two things, the RNA structure itself enhances. So what I need to do is position that oxygen close to this phosphorus for a productive nucleophilic attack. And I need this oxygen leaving group on the absolute opposite side of the, of the attacking group. So I need a 180 degree angle between the, these three atoms, the 2 prime oxygen, the phosphorus, and the 5 prime oxygen. Those geometric constraints are only met with an RNA that can sample that geometry, right? If, if you have an RNA that's highly structured, say in an A-form helix, it doesn't as, uh, assume that structure. So uh, in contrast, floppy RNAs can occasionally drop into that inline orientation and can spontaneously cleave. So what I have here is a very simple mechanism or, or, or method to probe whether the RNA is floppy or whether it's highly structured. So now we look back at this assay. These first three lanes are just marker lanes, no reaction. This is a nuclease uh, uh, digestion which cleaves after G residue. So you see every band here indicates cleavage after G residue. Hydroxyl um, uh, cleavage will cleave at every internucleotide linkage. The five lanes to the right here are the important ones. N we, we incubate this RNA now for a couple of days on the bench, uh, room temperature, um, slightly elevated pH, and nothing else but RNA and ligand. If we don't add anything, you see a number of bands here. Those bands correspond to the red and yellow positions on the RNA. Um, but if I add guanine, you see some of the bands stay. Those are indicated in yellow, but many of the bands go away. That implies that this part of the RNA used to be floppy, but now is becoming highly structured. There's only a couple of bands. This one here and this one here remain. Most, in most cases, G causes the RNA structure to change dramatically. Uh, uh, hypoxanthine and xanthine are guanine analogs that also bind to this RNA. Adenine, in contrast, the other purine, is rejected by this RNA. All right, so we can use this same approach, titrate in guanine, and measure how much of the RNA is being modulated structurally by changing guanine concentrations. We can plot out that modulation on a, on a, on a plot where we have a log of the concentration of guanine versus the fraction of the, the RNA that remains uh, uh, cleaved. We can plot this out. The half maximum modulation indicates or gives us a good estimate of the binding constant. So we have a very simple assay that we can use over and over again to look at whether the RNA changes shape as a good RNA switch should. And we can measure the affinity of these compounds so we can get an idea of the specificity of these RNAs. So I won't dwell on this data in, in much detail. Just note that, that we can introduce mutations and compensatory mutations that either dis, well, we can disrupt and then, um, and then restore base pairing. Uh, but with different nucleotides uh, compared to wild type. We can disrupt nucleotides that are otherwise highly conserved. And then we can subject these various mutant RNAs to a battery of tests. Here we're doing equilibrium dialysis. Here we're doing in vivo genetic assays with reporter genes. And the bottom line here is that if you disrupt the classic structure, the structure that bioinformatics says is important, you lose binding and you lose gene control with guanine. If you restore those uh, um, um, uh, structures with, with comp compensatory mutations, you restore binding and you restore gene control. All right, so one of our goals when we're studying these riboswitches is to identify the ligand uh, uh, and, and, and then to very quickly um, produce the data necessary for the structural biologists to take over. Because what we really in the long term are interested in is the three-dimensional structure of these RNAs. Those 3D structures will help us understand precisely the molecular recognition properties of these RNAs. And then ultimately, for, for long-term interest, if we're going to use these for various applications, we may want to use the structure to, to design compounds that will trick these riboswitches into, into shutting off gene expression, uh, uh, you know, even though the cell may require lots of uh, guanine, we can trick these cells into shutting off guanine metabolism. So uh, in this case, very quickly, Rob Beatty um, uh, took our data 
and uh, synthesized uh, various constructs, was able to crystallize the RNA and solve the atomic resolution structure from that data. And um, as the bioinformatics and our probing data predicted, this RNA forms a wonderful three-stem junction. Here's pairing element one. Pairing element two and three are parallel to each other, and the two loops of the stems grab each other. And the zone that's colored here, the green and blue and yellow, those are the sequences that were floppy in the absence of guanine, but then become highly structured when we add guanine. So these are the sequences that stood out, portions of the RNA that stood out when we did inline probing. All right, now I want to note, I should note that this nucleotide right here and this one here in green pointing down, those are two nucleotides that are predicted to be floppy in the crystal structure. And those two nucleotides are that position right here and this other major band that didn't modulate in inline probing. So inline probing is a very powerful approach, not only to tells us whether the RNA is modulated, but gives us a, a real good sense of, of what the structural context is for, for a, a number of nucleotides. All right, now, remember that odd colored purine riboswitch that I showed in a previous graphic. Well, we knew that four of those RNAs were guanine riboswitches, but we had speculated that if you're a guanine riboswitch and you were binding a G residue, chances are you're going to have a C residue in the aptamer and you're going to base pair, right? This is one of the four bases that we're, we want to bind. Why not use its complement in the aptamer itself to bind the compound? So here's a consensus for guanine riboswitch. We thought that perhaps some of these C residues may be involved in base pairing to, to, to G or one of these C residues. So I want you to focus on this one because that weird colored riboswitch that I had in that previous graphic is this one here. It's for uh, this purine pump. And it has, I think, 23. All the green nucleotides are, are, are different compared to this, this consensus. I think there's 23 mutations. Um, but I think 22 of the 23 mutations occur in regions that can tolerate mutations. You know, the green, these green bases change, but they largely retain base pairing. The only green nucleotide here, the only change that happens in a red base, in a highly conserved base, is that C changes to a U. And so we had predicted that that RNA, therefore, should bind adenine. It does. Uh, and crystal structures have now shown why that, why that is. I actually have a, a, a blow up of the binding site right here. So there are three uh, U residues that cradle the purine forming hydrogen bonding interactions with various parts of, of the guanine ligand in the center. And that C residue is that base identity in guanine switches, but it mutates to a U, and then the pur this, this purine binding site accommodates adenine and rejects guanine uh, in these rare variants. All right. But this graphic in its entirety is actually showing something, uh, something else, and that is that when, when we do bioinformatics searches to find more purine riboswitches, we can set our informatics algorithm to look for very distal variants, mutants that you don't think would actually be active. They, they have horribly corrupted the, 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 the nucleotides that are otherwise uh, would, be high, would be highly conserved. And so um, here shows the consensus guanine switch. This is one of the rare variants that we've pulled out. It's, it's hidden in this alignment. It's actually number two in this alignment. The top is a consensus guanine riboswitch, and all the red bases are, are you know, conform to the guanine uh, consensus. Uh, this one has 13 mutations in otherwise highly conserved bases, including mutations right in this core here that we know are responsible for ligand binding. And in fact, if you, if you, if you just transfer these mutations over to this binding site, the C residue is still the same. It's this one right here. But these three, three U residues have now mutated. And what we thought is that, well, that, those mutations could allow the accommodation of a ribose or a deoxyribose. And that was uh, uh, interesting to us because we know that the gene association here is ribonucleotide reductase. This RNA is controlling a gene that makes DNA monomers, not the free base. So uh, we assumed that this thing was binding 2 prime deoxyguanosine. We've indeed done inline probing. The RNA binds this compound, rejects this compound by orders of magnitude, and you can see the modulation and the affinity plot here, about 80 nanomolar for the KD. Now, I know there's a lot of data on this plot, but up here shows the 
So this is a log scale, the KD and a log scale. This is a normal guanine riba switch. Guanine is in blue. These switches reject all these other analogs by at least an order of magnitude or more. But this rare variant with the 13 mutations recognizes 2 prime deoxyguanosine in red and rejects all these other compounds by at least an order of magnitude. So we have a number of mutations in the switch that have switched the specificity uh, of the RNA to a, a related uh, uh, compound. And this, by the way, is a common theme. We see this now more and more as we're identifying more riboswitch classes. We're seeing these things as they've evolved through evolution to sense, uh, sense different compounds. All right, so what about riboswitches as druggable targets? So um, for quite some time, when we were beginning to find examples of riboswitches, um, I would claim that they should be good drug targets. And, and these were my arguments. Uh, riboswitches have evolved to intentionally bind small organic compounds. So if you're going, if you're going to drug, uh, make a drug compound that hits a protein, you'd like to go after ones that, that inherently bind a small organic compound. And, and you'll make variations of that compound or new, new compounds that will dock into the same binding site. Well, uh, we have now a large collection of RNAs that naturally bind small organic compounds. And therefore, we should be able to more easily find compounds that will trick these RNAs. Um, many of these riboswitches control the expression of genes whose protein products synthesize or transport essential metabolites. So not only do these things bind small organic compounds, but they, they're involved, intimately involved, in the production of compounds that are essential for the organisms. Some of the com in fact, most of the compounds sensed by riboswitches are present in all three domains of life. So they're really essential metabolites. Uh, some riboswitches are very common in, in bacteria, including many human pathogens. But after I would summarize this, I'd always get this, this question. If riboswitches are such good targets, then why haven't researchers identified compounds that bind to riboswitches? All right, so this really forced us. If we were going to stick to our hypothesis here, this really forced us to begin to produce some data that either supported or refuted this hypothesis. All right, so we've, we've done now a number of uh, experiments to try to explore this. Um, now, I, I, I just want to stress this one aspect about riboswitches and pathogens, which, which for us is quite inspiring. And, and that's that, uh, so on the top here, I'm listing a number of riboswitch classes. And on the, uh, the left-hand side here are a number of human pathogens. And, and so in each case, there's a number and, and then another number in parentheses. The first number is the number of known riboswitches of that particular riboswitch class in the organism. So um, for example, the first uh, organism here, Acinetobacter, has one TPP riboswitch, and it appears to control one gene. Right? In contrast, Bacillus anthracis uh, uh, has seven TPP riboswitches, controlling 19 genes. And, and that's actually quite true uh, for um, Bacillus anthracis across the board. It has many of the riboswitches that we've identified, and it has many versions of those riboswitches controlling many genes. It just seems well suited to be attacked by compounds that hit uh, riboswitches. Anyway, you'll notice that some of these riboswitch classes are almost universal in these pathogens, and some of them may be far more rare. It's a little bit unfair here. There's, as I said, there's uh, at least four different classes of SAM riboswitches. Some of them have SAM class one. If you don't have SAM class one, you'll have usually either class two, class three, or class four. Um, unfortunately, these RNAs sense the compound differently. So a drug that would hit one may not hit all four types. And so some of these you could imagine developing broad spectrum antibiotics against. Some of them may be more specialized. All right, so let's go back to this purine riboswitch and just see if we can attack a purine riboswitch and kill a bacterium in a, in a test tube. Now, we stuck with Bacillus subtilis because we knew it had five of these purine riboswitches, four of them for guanine. Just showing you here a list of the genes involved in the major metabolic circuitry for purine metabolism. The red genes are known to be essential. If you knock out a red gene up here, the cells die. The blue genes are the genes that are controlled by guanine sensing riboswitches. And you will notice that they do not overlap. It's inconceivable, but they do not overlap. So there are no essential genes that are controlled by the riboswitches. 
But if we had a compound that equally hit all four riboswitches, we would dysregulate all the blue genes simultaneously. And we felt as though that could be lethal. So what we've done is we've taken bacillus subtils and we've selectively knocked out the, the genes or operons that are controlled uh, by guanine riboswitches. We can do three of the four um, uh, genes or operons. We cannot knock all four out simultaneously. We've had to put this one under a controllable, inducible um, uh, promoter. Uh, and so if, if you don't induce it, the cells are dead. But if you induce it, um, the cells thrive. So we know that if you can disrupt all four of those um, uh, transcriptional units simultaneously, um, we, this should be lethal to the cells. All right, so the other thing I want to note is that since we have the crystal structure, we know where in this compound we can mess with the chemical structure. So there's a, there's a region here. This is the, the six position of the purine. There's space here. There's space here at the two position as well. So this is, a, we show it here as X and Y. We should be able to make analogs that are still bound by the RNA, and then we can test them for antimicrobial activity. And this just shows one of these compounds here in this slide. This one's called guanine-6. I'll bring it up again in, in subsequent slides. But it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see in this antibiotic uh, test here, this is a bacterial plate, a lawn of bacillus subtilis. But there's a dead zone around this filter disk where we've dropped some uh, guanine-6 on. This is a known antibiotic erythromycin. So we know we can kill cells. But the huge challenge is whether we have to determine whether or not the riboswitch is involved in the killing activity uh, for this compound. So instead of doing this with one compound, we've decided to synthesize a whole series of these compounds. Um, guanine-6 is right here. We've got a number of modifications at the uh, um, uh, two position and a number of additional modifications at the six position. And I want you to pay particular attention uh, to several of these compounds, guanine-6, Guanine 7, this hydroxylamine derivative, and guanine 15, uh, I believe, is the other one that I'll, I'll want you to watch. So in each case, we're determining the binding constants for these compounds, and we're using our inline probing assay. This just shows the assay for guanine 7. Uh, you can see these bands fading. We know the half maximum modulation is the KD, and the uh, KD for guanine 7 is 20 nanomolar. And that's compared to 5 nanomolar for guanine. So we haven't lost much affinity. So for some of these compounds, we lose a lot of affinity. Other compounds, we lose very little. All right, so now we screen these compounds for inhibition of bacterial growth. This is guanine 1 through guanine 16. And you'll notice that we've got a several uh, that inhibit by greater than 50% uh, growth. And I think this is at 100 micromolar uh, concentration of compound. All right. so. Unfortunately, only three of them, guanine 6, 7, and 15, give us total inhibition of cell growth. The other compounds that inhibit don't fully inhibit. They, they partially inhibit. They don't totally inhibit growth. So we've dropped those that only partially inhibit. We're only focused on the ones that totally inhibit. So then we look at gene control. So we have a reporter gene hooked up to a guanine riboswitch, the XPT guanine riboswitch. And we look for expression of uh, uh, the reporter gene. In the absence of guanine, we get very high expression, as you'd expect. This is in minimal medium, so we can supplement this with guanine. And we get very low gene expression. Uh, we add guanine 6. No or very little effect on expression. So even though we know guanine 6 inhibits bacterial growth, it is not hitting the riboswitch. We think the same thing for guanine 15. Guanine 7, though, inhibits the riboswitch. This is this hydroxylamine derivative. Uh, if we mutate the reporter, uh, the riboswitch on the reporter gene, we get pretty much uh, uniform expression. Uh, so now guanine uh, 7, we know, is working through the riboswitch mechanism and not by some other mechanism. At least we know it's binding. Now, um, so there's a number of experiments. In a slide that I don't have, we've selected for resistance to um, guanine-6. We couldn't get resistance to guanine-7 or guanine-15, uh, just that we couldn't raise the concentration of the compounds high enough uh, 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 to get meaningful resistance, uh, uh, but we could for guanine-6. And uh, guanine-6, we get resistance strains. They have a mutation in a riboswitch, but not 
any of the guanine sensing ribose switches. It has a mutation in the adenine sensing ribose switch that we sequenced as a control. And what we think is happening there is that the mutation turns on the expression of a purine pump, which throws the drug out of the cell. Okay. Um, um, so we can't say much about resistance for uh, the other guanine compounds. But what I can say, and, and this is sort of modest evidence in favor of uh, a ribose switch mechanism for this compound, as we titrate in compound, uh, we get uh, um, further suppression of gene expression. And the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration for the compound, so the concentration that fully inhibits uh, bacterial growth, is just upstream, or just uh, slightly more than the concentration needed to fully inhibit gene expression. All right, so what about other riboswitch classes? Okay, this is just a simple demonstration. We've made some compounds that fit to the riboswitch. These are all new compounds um, that we've made for this particular study. But what about older compounds? And there's actually two, um, two uh, classes of compounds that we know, um, we've known for decades, kill bacteria. But the, 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 the functions were not known until uh, now where we have evidence that these, these compounds actually target, at least in part, uh, target riboswitches to, to uh, bring about their antimicrobial effect. Uh, one compound, this compound is uh, called pyrethymine. I'm showing the, the, the diphosphorylated form called pyrethymine pyrophosphate. It's a compound that was made in the 1940s, I think 1942, was shown to kill bacteria and fungi. Uh, we now know that this compound is wonderfully bound by TPP riboswitches. This is a crystal structure solved by Ninad Ban. And what's shown here is that there's a pyrophosphate binding site in this arm of the aptamer. There's an HMP, I'm sorry, the HMP sites over here, the pyrophosphate sites over here. And this methylthiazole moiety in TPP is not recognized by the RNA. And that's exactly where the chemical modification is uh, in pyrethymine pyrophosphate. So we think that the riboswitch has a blind spot for that, for that part of the compound. And, uh, and therefore, uh, this and other derivatives should work to trick these riboswitches. We've shown all the kinds of data we've shown with guanine with this one as well, both in bacteria and in fungi. Oh, by the way, uh, I wanted to mention why does it work in fungi? TPP riboswitches are, are the, the one class where we see many representatives in eukaryotes as well as in bacteria. And in, in fungi, this one is in Neurospora crassa, we have a situation where the aptamer is sitting in an intron. And we know that in the absence of thymus, when the cells are starved for thymine, they will fully splice a, a, a messenger RNA. And it's this smaller messenger RNA that is expressed to produce a protein for um, thymine metabolism. But in this experiment here, we've dropped in thymine at time zero, and then watch as the splicing changes. Now we have an intermediate size splice product and here's unspliced messenger RNA. So thiamine pyrophosphate is modulating this splicing process. And in the cartoon uh, on the left is shown how that, that occurs. The aptamer is, as I said, embedded in the intron. Here's the three prime splice site uh, for the intron. Here's a five prime splice site. But this RNA has two possible five prime splice sites. So when thiamine is, is absent, Part of the aptamer, this is the pyrophosphate binding domain of the aptamer, will base pair over top of the splice site, that, of this uh, splice site here. That forces the spliceosome to join this 5' prime splice site to this uh, 3' prime splice site. Gives you a small RNA, that's this one on this gel, and you have an AUG, it's the first AUG in the spliced RNA, and that uh, allows uh, a translation. But when you have thiamine pyrophosphate very high or the drug compound very high, the compound is bound to the aptamer. This part no longer can base pair across the splice site. So now the spliceosome takes this splice site, joins it to the three prime, giving you a longer RNA, which is this intermediate sized RNA. And that has two decoy start codons, which prevents translation of the main open reading frame. All right, and it's th these kinds of systems are very common in fungi and plants, all responding to thiamine pyrophosphate. All right, so I wanted to tell you another example of a riboswitch where we've made, we, we have old compounds, compounds made in the 1950s, and new compounds that we've prepared that actually function against the riboswitch. Uh, so here is a, a, a lysine sensing 
uh, ribose switch from Bacillus subtilis. This is controlling the lyse C gene. It's an aspartokinase gene. It's, the, it's really one of the first steps in route to lysine biosynthesis. So the ribose switch controls one of the first steps in, in route to production of more of, of lysine. And you can see all the classic elements. We have an anti-terminator here, terminator stem. The two are going to compete based on whether the ligand is bound or not. Lysine, of course, is the compound that's being sensed. And there were a couple of compounds known for decades to kill bacteria, which are very similar to lysine. Now, some of these compounds, I think both of them actually, are known to be incorporated into proteins. And so that's certainly a possible source for antimicrobial activity. But we also know now that these compounds do bind to the riboswitch, and they inhibit the production of lysine. Uh, and so it may be a, a dual effect where this, the analogs are being incorporated in proteins, causing problems at that level. But the amount that gets incorporated in proteins can be boosted by suppressing the amount of lysine that the cells actually produce. So here is the uh, pathway again. We're going from aspartate. Aspartokinase um, is converted uh, into this phosphorylated uh, amino acid with lyse C, or there's a couple of uh, uh, homologous proteins uh, that will do the same. And then there's a series of reactions that get you down to lysine. And of course, there's prominent bacterial functions that branch off this, spore formation, cell wall biosynthesis, et cetera. And I should say in Bacillus subtilis, we have a double riboswitch situation. So there's a riboswitch that controls this gene. And there's a second uh, lysine riboswitch that controls lyse A. So compounds that hit this switch should hit both riboswitches. So here's a crystal structure. This was produced by Dinshaw Patel's lab at Sloan Kettering. Um, they have an atomic resolution structure uh, of one of these. You can see uh, the secondary structure now is modeled after the tertiary structure. You have this uh, pseudonaut interaction, various other structural features that allow this RNA to bend around, forming this huge loop. But it's way down here where the core of the ligand binding uh, is. Lysine will dock into this highly conserved red core of the riboswitch. And we even know the uh, nucleotides now that are recognizing the amino acid. And it, you, know, you look at this from a drug discovery standpoint, and you'd say, well, how am I going to trick this riboswitch? There's a potassium that's recognizing, uh, or it's involved in recognizing the carboxyl group of the amino acid. The amine of the main chain uh, atoms here is recognized by base residues, by hydrogen bonding. Uh, the other amine at the, in the side chain is recognized by waters and by nucleotides. And in, in, in fact, if you, if you had a space filling model, you'd be convinced that there's even probably van der Waals interactions, certainly steric clashes between the RNA and the ligand. So it's going to be very hard to trick this, this RNA. And yet, these very similar analogs, analogs that are similar to lysine, can do a fairly good job. Uh, oxalysine, this is the inline probing assay. We see oxalysine binding. It's a couple of orders of magnitude poorer, but it still, still binds. And we think if it gets into the cell, it should still trigger gene expression uh, control. And we, we've used a number of analogs to sort of crudely map out uh, the molecular recognition characteristics before the crystal structure was done, which gave us some clues as to what compound, what analogs we could make to try to further trick this riboswitch. We've made a lot of compounds. Most of them don't bind. Uh, we see this, uh, this uh, uh, sulfoxyl. Um, um, or sulfonyl uh, uh, analog working. We see uh, oxalysine, of course, works. Uh, homoarginine works. We've got additional bulk on the side chain. We have this uh, um, alkene derivative of, of lysine, which binds quite well. And there's one additional compound here. Uh, this uh, iminoethyl uh, derivative also binds quite well. Everything else there doesn't bind well. So now we can subject cells to all of these compounds and ask which ones work, which ones don't. And hopefully, there'll be some sort of a correlation between what binds and what actually kills cells. So this is a, this is a, a graphic very similar to what we showed before. Uh, uh, minimal medium, minus and plus lysine. We get full growth of, of the cells. Now, various analogs of lysine have various effects. The, the compounds with circles around actually have measurable binding to the riboswitch. So you can see compounds 1 and 2 and 4 that we know bind actually work. Uh, compounds 3 and 7 don't. So either the riboswitch uh, has nothing to do with um, um, the, the, the effects of these compounds, or perhaps some of these compounds don't enter the cell. Or if they enter the cell, they may be modified in some way so that they no longer bind the riboswitch. 
There are a couple of compounds, eight and nine, that kill bacteria or inhibit bacterial growth, but we know they don't bind the riboswitch. All right, so we've done some further analyses for compounds where we can get MIC values from. And so compounds one, two, and four, we can get MICs for. In other words, they, they inhibit growth at a concentration that's, that's uh, achievable in, in cell culture. And those three compounds that we can get MICs for are also the three compounds that inhibit expression. So we know all three of those are inhibiting um, the riboswitch expression. All these other compounds don't uh, significantly inhibit uh, riboswitch expression. And just like the guanine case, these compounds, here's compound one and two, will inhibit gene expression and give inhibition that's maximal right at the point of the MIC for the compounds. And again, this is not proof that they're hitting the riboswitches, but it's what you'd expect if indeed they were hitting riboswitches. All right, I won't dwell on this data too much other than to say that we've selected for mutants that will disrupt the, the effects. They overcome uh, the, the, the effects of these lysine analogs. And again, I'm not going to go through the data in great detail. I just want to say that those mutations which occur, here's the binding pocket for lysine. They occur remotely from the binding pocket. Uh, and they make these uh, organisms resistant to these lysine analogs. They do not alter the affinity of the drug for the, uh, of the RNA for the drug. They still bind with the same affinity. But what they do, and it's really detailed on here, but I, again, I won't go into the, into the details. What they, what they appear to do is that they shift the extent of transcription termination of the RNA. So the, the RNAs uh, still bind the compound, but they, they fail to fully terminate transcription. And so it looks like the switches become more leaky when they accrue these mutations. Again, we think this is an indication that um, uh, you know, manipulation of the function of the riboswitch is consistent with uh, these compounds uh, hitting, hitting riboswitches and having meaningful antimicrobial effect. There's one more compound I want to mention. I really talked about all these compounds up here for thymine riboswitches, lysine riboswitches, and guanine switches. But I want to talk about one more very briefly, and that's a compound called roseoflavin, which targets FMN uh, riboswitches. And what's significant about this compound is it's a natural compound. It's, it's produced by a species of Streptomyces. Uh, it's been known as an antimicrobial agent probably since the mid-1980s. And we now know, given its similarity in structure, that it should be a good ligand for, for FMN riboswitches. And indeed, we have now the, the data to support that. So here's uh, um, FMN. So FMN is if there's a methyl group at R1, and R2 is a phosphate. Riboflavin, the vitamin, uh, is just a dephosphorylated version of FMN, so it's missing uh, phosphate at R2. And roseoflavin is different from the vitamin in that instead of having a methyl group here, it has this dimethyl amino group. Okay? So we can do binding assays. We find that, you know, we knew before that, that riboflavin was, was binding about a thousand fold poorer in affinity compared to FMN. So FMN is probably the biologically relevant ligand. But roseoflavin, which just has this difference at this one position, binds about 10 or 20 fold more tightly than the vitamin. So we think that this compound is, is you know, well accommodated uh, by the, uh, the aptamer. Uh, uh, resistant mutations have been selected for. Uh, we see mutations, again, in various parts of the RNA. Uh, here's the wild type RNA. You get full gene expression without the addition of any ligand. But if you add riboflavin or roseoflavin, you get uh, significant uh, inhibition of gene expression. Uh, but if you take that same reporter construct, but with mutations at either one of those three positions, you get, le uh, you know, you get reduced or no inhibition with these compounds. So the riboswitch is actually undergoing mutations that cause it to um, uh, disregard these compounds, and, the, and so gene expression just stays on pretty much wide open throughout the, uh, the entire growth phase. Uh, so here, just an interesting side note, the organism that produces roseoflavin, that naturally produces roseoflavin, also has an FMN riboswitch, and it looks like a conventional riboswitch. So we've looked at whether the Streptomyces riboswitch will bind these three compounds, and it does. It binds all three in the same order that it does. Uh, that, that other organisms riboswitches do. So 
this organism, if, it is a, if the compound is targeting riboswitches, this organism does not appear to have a specialized riboswitch that discriminates selectively against roseoflavin. It must have some other trick to, for it to avoid becoming poisoned by its own toxic compound. And again, Dinshaw Patel has now recently published the, the structure uh, of this RNA. Here's this large 6 stem junction folding up to bind FMN. And they've solved the structure with FMN, with roseoflavin, and riboflavin. Here they are overlapping each other. And uh, uh, riboflavin is the blue ring structure, and it's largely masked by the red of, of uh, uh, roseoflavin. And you can see that there's a pocket here that accommodates that, dime that dimethyl amino uh, modification that would fill in this pocket over here in the space filling model. So from a, from a drug discovery standpoint, we think that there's plenty of room. This pocket here, for example, this large pocket down here. And in fact, many changes one could make in this region here to sample a much greater variety of FMN analogs to try to find compounds that not only kill bacteria, but have the right bioavailability and pharmacokinetics that you would want for a useful antibiotic. All right, now, I'm essentially out of time here. I just want to quickly show you an example of a riboswitch that I wish I could drug. So we are finding many more riboswitches, and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely talk about um, uh, additional riboswitch classes that we're finding uh, tomorrow. Um, but very briefly, how we're finding them is we're looking for non-coding gaps in the genomes of any bacterium that we can find, uh, any bacterium whose genome has been sequenced. We find, um, we use computer-aided searches to look for highly conserved sequences and structures. That's the most productive way of finding these switches. We find lots of new RNA structures. Some of them are riboswitches. Some of them are very strange RNAs, which I'll talk more about tomorrow. But the one that I wanted to note here is this RNA that we call GEM. It's a, it's a two-stem, it looked like a two-stem junction. It's actually a three-stem uh, junction. That RNA selectively binds this compound, cyclic di-GMP, which of course itself is an RNA. It's an RNA dinucleotide that has two 3' prime, 5' prime phosphate ester bonds, forms a circular RNA, and acts as a very widespread second messenger in many, many bacterial species. It's as it's, 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 it's close to ubiquitous, I think, as a bacterial second messenger can get. And uh, we now have uh, a couple of classes of riboswitches that respond to changing concentration of this, of this compound. And I will show you quickly inline probing, plus and minus ligand. You can see structural modulation. We map all that structural modulation to the bottom of this RNA. Uh, we can get binding constants. Uh, we knew that the, from this data, the binding constant was no poorer than one nanomolar. It's actually, this is the limit of our assay. It's actually in the uh, picomolar range, which is significant because bacterial cells, um, you know, one molecule has a concentration in the low nanomolar range. So these things have uh, affinities that are actually uh, can sense better than one molecule per cell. And it's very selective for cyclic DiGMP. It, it rejects many of the other compounds. Um, I will skip over this other than to say that um, uh, we can do mutations and compensatory mutations, look at them genetically. We find genetic on switches for, for cyclic DIG um, sensing RNAs. We find genetic off switches for them. Uh, Scott Strobel's lab has solved the crystal structure of this RNA. And although it, this is an all RNA switch, They've modified the RNA to, to, to favor crystallization by putting an, a, a protein binding site at one of the tips that we knew wasn't uh, genetically relevant here. The compound, cyclic DiGMP, is cradle at the very bottom of the RNA. Uh, and in fact, our bioinformatics missed uh, a base paired region that we now see in the crystal structure. And ligand binding actually stabilizes that base pairing. A couple of unique features. One of the Gs is, is recognized by Watson Crick base pairing to a C. The other G is a non-standard interaction with a G. And then there's a highly conserved A residue from the aptamer that slots in between the two uh, Gs to stack in there. And it gives us a, an extraordinary affinity and stabilization of this bottom part of the RNA. Just to, just to remind you, all the modulation was happening down here. The ligand binds right in that zone, right down in here. All right, so why do I want to drug this RNA? We know that pathogens will have this, this RNA. Here's Vibrio cholera, has two chromosomes. There's a riboswitch on each of the chromosomes. This protein in particular 
is the one that is expressed when the cells want to infect human cells. It's the, it's the uh, protein that binds human cells to allow infection. Clostridium difficile has 12 of these RNAs. When we see an open box, we don't know what the gene function is, but we know that the hairpin here in, indicates the, the, I'm just mapping out the riboswitch there. One of the transcripts is the entire uh, operon uh, for a flagellar apparatus biosynthesis. So these cells are making a decision whether they swim or whether they form biofilms based on riboswitch reading the concentration of this second messenger. And then interesting, these are the first two examples of riboswitches in a virus. And what it appears is happening here is that bacteriophage has a cyclic Dig sensing riboswitch to determine the physiological status of the cell uh, in, in order for it to determine whether it, it will reproduce or whether it will stay uh, silent. And then there are some crazy organisms. This one's not a pathogen. Um, Geobacter uranium reducens has 30 of these RNAs and 25 transcriptional units. Um, and including some that are tandem. I just show this very quickly because some of the cyclic Dig ribus switches we see are like this TPP switch where we have an aptamer expression platform, another aptamer and expression platform. We see things like this when the cells are trying to read out very sensitively tiny changes in concentration of ligand. And this will give you that kinetic capability. All right, so to uh, conclude, just want to uh, note that um, you know, we know that both RNA and DNA polymers can fold into a great diversity of complex shapes. Uh, they can serve as receptors and as, as catalysts. Uh, uh, we've, we've done a lot of engineering of, of aptamers and allosteric ribozymes, and I want to focus on this a little bit more uh, tomorrow um, uh, to stress how strange these things can get in the test tube, but also to highlight some of the stranger ones that we've found in biology. We know that many bacteria rely on the natural versions of these, uh, uh, and we think we have uh, at least the beginnings of a data set that imply that some of these can work as druggable targets. And um, we're continuing to find new riboswitch candidates, uh, and some of these are going to exhibit really extraordinary architectures or functions. And again, I will stress most of this tomorrow. But things like tandem arrangement of functional RNAs add increasing biochemical diversity and increasing, therefore increasing biological diversity. And I will end by acknowledging a few of the people who've done uh, much of the work that I, that I described. Um, so uh, Elaine Lee is a grad student uh, who's done the bulk of the work on the Rosia Flavin uh, story. Um, uh, Zasha Weinberg has done much of the bioinformatics, including revealing the, you know, the number of the riboswitches that I showed uh, today. Um, Let's see, Adam Roth uh, has headed up uh, the bulk of the uh, purine uh, uh, riboswitch work along with uh, a former grad student, uh, Jane Kim. Uh, and uh, Narasimhan Sudarsan has been doing, uh, he and a number of co-workers in the lab have been doing the bulk of the work on cyclic DIGMP riboswitches, uh, including with Elaine and another graduate student, uh, Jenny Baker. Okay, I should stop there and be happy to field any questions. Thanks much. You sort of mentioned in passing that the um, genes regulated by riboswitches for guanine, I think, and those that are essential for growth were non-overlapping. And I wondered how universal that is. How many sort of essential genes have riboswitches? And if that's not the case, if you have any ideas, why right. not? Right. So, so, if, so, so there's some interesting issues in there. For example, if you rarely saw ribus, which is controlling essential genes. That may imply that organisms have figured out that they make good drug targets. And so uh, organisms have responded through evolution to avoid controlling essential genes with things that may be easy to, to, to fool, to trick, with, with compounds like roseaflavin. Um, now, having said that, I would say that most likely, the, in the case of purine biosynthesis and bacillus subtilis, it may just be an unfortunate accident for us. Uh, uh, that all the individually essential genes don't overlap with the, the riboswitch regulon that we've identified. But I think the bottom line is that many organisms are using riboswitches of the same class and therefore 
being able to be fooled by the same compound uh, to control multiple genes. And so the, the true test of whether the, the, the switch is going to be an important target is whether it's controlling a collection of genes that together, when you suppress their expression, will be uh, deleterious to the cell. So I think, again, there's, there's interesting evolutionary arguments one could make for why you would be unlikely to see essential genes. But, but uh, you know, we see other cases where that's certainly not true. Uh, FMN ribo switches, almost always controlling genes that are individually essential for cell survival. Yes? In your uh, study of ribo switches, I was wondering if you perhaps uh, picked up on other binding sites, perhaps protein binding sites within the ribo switch, perhaps under allosteric control, and could those allosteric sites perhaps be also equally good sites for drug development? Yes, yeah, so you're, you're asking perhaps a, a fairly sensitive question for me. As an RNA biochemist, uh, I've encouraged the lab to work very hard to focus on RNAs that work without the aid of proteins. But your, your question is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, th this way of thinking is absolutely correct and maybe even more biologically relevant than us handpicking RNAs that are only, you know, all RNA systems. There will be protein factors involved. Uh, in, not in all of these, but, but in many of them there, there, cer there certainly can be. And so I like the idea of um, you know, if you can in influence the function of a riboswitch by manipulating a protein factor that may associate, I think that's great. The, the one drawback is that since proteins have 20 amino acids to work with, uh, you can imagine that they would evolve more quickly or, or more smoothly in evolution. And so having a more broad spectrum uh, uh, um, drug target with, with proteins that are interacting with ribose, which is maybe less likely than tar targeting the RNA directly. These RNAs only have four types of monomers to work with. If they're binding a compound that never changes in evolution, those nucleotides at the binding core are going to be very similar th throughout evolution. And so we may be able to target a broader range of pathogens by, by going after the, the, the RNA component and not the protein component. Yes? In the, uh, in the ligand, binds to the RNA, uh, when it becomes compact, uh, they, can it, this bring the pseudonaut uh, base pairing closer together? In a yeah, so we, th we think in some riboswitch classes, we have data that support exactly that situation where uh, you have the potential for a riboswitch, but it's not formed in the absence of ligand. But when you add ligand, you see these regions becoming highly structured. So we, we think we see global rearrangements uh, akin to what you're talking about. You're changing s secondary structure patterning, not just subtle tertiary structure interactions, with, with some examples. Yes? So attempts to use uh, ribose switches in eukaryotic cells have not have been as forthcoming, and a lot of difficulties have been encountered. Is it possible that either the ribosome differences or compartmentalization of the eukaryotic cells are going to be a barrier or an obstacle? Yeah, so there's, there, uh, you're talking about an area that I think is generating a lot of interest, and that is can you adapt either natural riboswitches from bacteria or engineered RNA switches where you, you use test tube evolution or other engineering approaches to create an aptamer? and create an expression platform, fuse them together, and control gene expression in eukaryotes, uh, which has all sorts of wonderful applications. And those uh, efforts have been frustrating. There's been some successes, you know, maybe more frustrations than, than successes. One of the major problems, just grafting a, a natural aptamer into a eukaryote, is that the uh, mechanisms for gene control don't apply you know, you can't port uh, a transcription termination mechanism into a eukaryote and expect RNA polymerase is going to treat it the same way. So you have to have more generalized expression platforms that you can swap from uh, domain of life to another domain of life. Uh, and this is maybe where control of self-splicing ribozymes or self-cleaving ribozymes might be very attractive. Because if you can cleave or splice an RNA in a bacterium, that, and, and it's independent of protein factors, you may be able to put that right into a eukaryotic system and get the same result. On the RNA engineering side, there's additional problems. 
because the aptamers or the expression platforms haven't been valid, many of them haven't been validated to work in a cell. They may, 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 we, we've got examples that we haven't published where these things work beautifully in a test tube and you move them into an E. coli cell and you'll get threefold gene modulation when we were looking for 300 fold. Uh, or in a, in a rare instance or two, you put them into the cell and they actually switch in the opposite direction than what you designed them to do. They work one direction in the test tube, they work in the opposite direction marginally uh, in the cell. So it, there's not a full enough understanding of how these things work in their native context to sit down with pencil and paper and design useful genetic switches. I think, I think one of the advantages to having the naturals is that we can reverse engineer you know, how do they work in bacteria. Um, can we put some of those design principles in our engineered versions to get them to work in bacteria or in, in, in eukaryotes, like including humans? So, thanks. All right. That's, I'll invite everyone to join us at the reception of the library. That's all. And All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.